Hi, I'm Rich Stevens, a member of the Fakre Group. This clip focuses on the glass transition, the changing of a liquid to a disordered solid. I sketched the structures above. There's the hot liquid on the left, cooler glass on the right. Looking at the structure, the difference between the liquid and glass is remarkably subtle. One can only see that the glass is a little more dense. But that density change influences its viscosity enormously. I show here a log-log plot of viscosity versus 1 over T for molten silica with its density noted at the ends. You can see that over a factor of 3 in temperature, silica's density varies by 30%, but then its viscosity varies by 10 trillion. That is, from the thickness of honey, a drip in a few seconds, to that of road tar, a drip in a decade, to another factor of 10,000 times more rigid, where it's defined as, as a solid at 10 to the 13th poise. All glasses solidify like that. Here I've added data for lots of other materials, all scaled so that the temperature of the transition, Tg, is at the right-hand side of the graph. You can see that the continuous but rapid viscosity increase at Tg is typical, and that silica, the straight line on the left, as one of the slowest. Orthoterphenol, which is typical of the molecular solids studied in the Fakrai group, is on the other end. There the viscosity changes by an order of magnitude every few degrees Kelvin. And not shown here, the viscosity continues to increase at a similar rate as one cools further. The density increases too, but with a difference. The density is determined by two components, the vibrational amplitude that stretches the structure, and the configuration, that is, how the atoms are packed. On decreasing temperature, the structure shrinks because of reduced vibration and collapsing to a lower energy configuration. Below Tg, the second of these two no longer happens. The structure is frozen so that the density of the rate of density change decreases. One can cool slower or anneal to get to those higher densities below Tg. The glass would then be said to have a fictive temperature, Tf, which is lower than Tg. But since the restructuring rate is limited by viscosity, feasible experiments can reduce Tf to only a few percent below Tg. In the most extreme example, annealing amber for tens of millions of years reduces Tf by about 10%. That limitation is broken at surfaces. This graph shows the bulk relaxation measured for molecular glass, diphenylbenzidine. You can see the relaxation time increasing very rapidly below Tg. But at the surface, which we can probe by measuring the diffusion around a 16 nanometer particle, one finds relaxation time many orders of magnitude faster and increasing much more slowly. One can use that rapid surface equilibration to build films. Every atom of a vapor deposit film starts out at the surface where relaxation is rapid. For sufficiently slow deposition, such that incoming particles settle in before being buried, one will end up with a film structure that has been totally equilibrated and one needn't wait for 20 million years. So, if one deposits sufficiently slowly, one can produce a vapor deposit film which has a density and presumably a structure characteristic of the temperature at which it was deposited. We know this because that film can be heated to above Tg, where it turns into an ordinary liquid, and then recooled to see what the thickness would be as an ordinary quenched film. We take its fictive temperature to be where the thickness crosses the extrapolated supercooled liquid line. One finds that Tf is near the deposition temperature down to about 15% below Tg. Now, these films are very different than the ordinary glass, a denser by more than a percent and stable to considerably above Tg. So what are they? Well, new material gives new opportunities to ask questions. First, what are the properties of these films? Diffusion, toughness, crack formation, acoustic loss, all these topics are being addressed in the group. Second, these films have dramatically different properties at their surfaces. How are they affected by them? 
Well, we approach that by using very thin films that are nearly all surface. Third, how stable are they? Well, that's been hard to tell because transformation propagates from free surface. We haven't been able to prevent that. Fourth, what materials will do this? Well, they've been seen in molecular solids bound by van der Waals forces. The presence of hydrogen and covalent bonds interfere. We're examining that using selenium, which forms covalent chains. Fine. Finally, ask your own question. Mine is, what is the limit of the low fictive temperature? I ask that because of a puzzle proposed 80 years ago by Walter Kausman. He noted that the entropy in glasses decreases faster than in crystals. This graph shows entropy versus temperature. Now remember, a uh, change in entropy is heat capacity times the change in temperature, and the specific heat of a glass is higher than that of a crystal because of its restructuring. In extrapolating this data, one finds a temperature now called the Kalsman temperature, uh, Tk, below which the entropy of the glass would be less than that of its crystal form. We don't know what that means. It's been referred to as a Kalsman catastrophe. It's provoked much discussion about what entropy means in a glass. At, at Tg, when the glass structure freezes, the difference in slope disappears. So problem is avoided. But but what if we could equilibrate a TK? Is that an ideal glass? By equilibrating to a low temperature, we can find out. As I said before, cool, slow cooling doesn't get you very far. Vapor deposition gets further. Here's data for vapor deposited ethyl benzene. The deposition rate has to slow considerably to 0.02 nanometers per second for the lowest temperatures. Doing that, one can get within a few percent of Tk and about a tenth of percent from the expected density there. Is this a perfect glass? And how would we know? Well, saying a glass has an entropy equal to a crystal suggests to me that it has, has only one structural state, which the usual glasses don't have in any normal sense. Every time you freeze a glass, you get a, a different one. But in addition, ordinary glasses have multiple accessible states so that after freezing, a few atoms can still move even at very low temperatures. These mobile states give glasses a unique set of low temperature properties, a specific heat proportional to temperature. At 1K, that contribution is much larger than the phonon specific heat. Phonon scattering that limits thermal phonon mean free path to about 100 phonon wavelengths. Both are very different than that observed for crystals, where the phonons account for all the specific heat, and the phonon mean free path is limited only by the crystal size. As you might expect, these mobile structures also cause acoustic attenuation. This can be easily observed when glasses are used as components in oscillators. Films are often measured by depositing onto a single crystalline silicon wafer cut into a double paddle configuration. The sample is deposited on the neck between the counterswinging paddles uh, where it can be torqued. It is remarkable that the losses that one measures this way are almost independent of the type of glass. Here are results for some films, oxides, chalcogenides, metallic, and even looking at a wider range, including polymers and molecular glasses, these losses are one, ubiquitous, and two, similar in all, both in their spectral density and in their coupling to phonons. And people care about them. These glassy states limit the sensitivity of such things as LIGO and its cousins. Those are gravity wave detectors. And they compromise the reliability of quantum, quantum computing schemes. Now, these states must disappear as TF approaches TK. The glass couldn't approach zero entropy otherwise. But how? Do they diminish gradually? There is some evidence 
that the spectral density of these states decreases with lower TF. Here is a plot of losses for a variety of vapor deposit silicon films. Those deposited in the ordinary way have losses near that typical for glasses. Annealing reduces losses somewhat. The lowest curve here is from a low temperature deposition. Now remember Tg for silicon is 1000 centigrade, so a 800 centigrade deposition is low temperature. And uh, low temperature, it's within the range that we have seen uh, super stable glasses in the molecular solids. You can see that in this case, the losses are lower by an order of magnitude. Now, is this simply a refinement of the ordinary glass with fewer thermal fluctuations? Experiments have shown that the super stable low TF films transform to ordinary glass in ways reminiscent of melting. That is, a transformation front propagates across the low TF film. Perhaps that indicates a phase change. Its significance is a current question in this group. So, to summarize, TG marks the transition between liquid and glass states. Unlike crystallization, there isn't a structural change at this point. This is a kinetic transformation. So, glass contains fluctuations typical of the temperature of that transition. Annealing can uh, reduce those fluctuations, making structures typical of a somewhat lower temperature TF. Vapor deposition can make films with much lower TF and in fact make uh, the ones with TF very close to the TK where we would expect the entropy of the glass to be similar to that of a crystal. These films are much denser and more stable and change to ordinary glass through a moving transformation front. Now, are they a different phase? The different the perfect glass one expects if TF equals TK. The perfection can be measured by density of tunneling states, which are ubiquitous in liquid cooled glass. Do these states suddenly disappear in a phase change or disappear gradually with reducing TF? We don't know, but we'll find out. Thank you.